Hi everyone, and welcome to Cloud Coffee Break. Uh, would you believe it? This is episode six already. So this episode completes uh, a three-part story uh, about integration testing serverless applications. And so before I get into this episode's new content, I want to give a little bit of a quick recap of what's happened over the last two episodes. So back in episode four, I introduced integration testing for serverless applications. And the key to the way that I do these tests is that the application under test is deployed in the cloud and it is not running in local simulators. Now, this episode was a great start, but the tests always ran against the same instance of our application, uh, the one in a stack named SAM app. Didn't matter where we were running, who was running it, the tests always ran against that same instance. In episode five, I introduced the concept of having multiple deployment environments and using these for testing. And what this means is that if you and I are on the same team, we can each run tests against our own versions of the application. In episode five, I also added integration tests into our CI automation. And this significantly increases the value of our CI testing. However, the problem here was that the CI tests are always using the same instance of the application every time. And so if our instance uh, becomes corrupted for any reason, uh, then manual intervention is necessary in order to fix that. And it's with this problem in mind that this episode is all about ephemeral test environments. What this means is that we use temporary environments for testing, and we just use those temporary environments one time. So let's dig in. The idea with ephemeral test environments is the following. As part of the setup phase of an integration test suite, we stand up an entirely new deployment environment in the cloud. The setup phase completes with getting the location of that new deployment environment's interface. In our case at the moment, that's the API endpoint. The tests then run just as we did in the previous episodes, but against this temporary environment. In the teardown phase of the test suite, we delete the temporary deployment environment since it's now served its purpose. Now, typically, I make this new way the default mode of running integration tests, but we also want to allow using an existing environment, and we don't want to tear that down. Now, typically, the second mode is useful during a development episode where we want some more rapid feedback. So this idea of ephemeral environments is clearly extra work, and it introduces extra latency in our integration test suite. So why do we do it? Well, there are two main reasons. Firstly, this guarantees a clean application test environment every time. So typically with setup and teardown in tests, we delete the contents of data stores, and that's sufficient in traditional applications. But for serverless development, the set of components that make up the application is often much more dynamic. And so if there's been a bug with the resource configuration during a previous test run, then that might not be something we can clean up just by emptying a database or an S3 bucket. Instead, by creating a new stack every time, we guarantee the application we're testing has all the resources and configuration we intend it to have. The second reason is that sometimes we might want to perform separate integration test runs in parallel. So for example, say you run integration tests every time someone makes a change to a pull request branch in GitHub. If three people are working on three different PRs, it would be really nice if their automated integration tests aren't queued up, but instead can run concurrently. So by having isolated ephemeral test environments per integration test run, we know that our integration tests aren't going, into, aren't going to interfere with each other assuming that there aren't any downstream conflicts. So those of you that have been programmers for a few years may be worried that this way of performing tests is very expensive. Creating entirely new environments that only last for a few minutes certainly sounds like it wouldn't be cheap. But the great thing is that this is where the cost models of serverless really help us again. If we were using a service that was charged by the hour or day, then it's unlikely that we want to use this technique. 
But because serverless services charge by precise usage, it's likely that in many cases that having ephemeral environments don't actually cost any more at all. So here's a diagram summarizing how we're going to do this. On the left hand side, we have our test. In that case, that's running in a framework called Jest uh, in Node. And so before and after we run our test, we have a before all and an after all function. The before all function is now going to be responsible for deploying a brand new stack using CloudFormation. And CloudFormation is going to deploy our actual application. And in, the, in our case at the moment, that's an API gateway and a Lambda function. Once setup is complete, we can run our test just as normal. So it's going to query the API gateway endpoint. Once all the tests have completed, we are done with this environment. And so the after all function or teardown function can then delete uh, the application stack. So that's going to delete all the resources for us. So given the work that we've done in the previous episodes, there isn't actually too much that we need to do in order to enable ephemeral environments in our project. But I'm going to break this up into three steps anyway. First of all, I'm going to make the changes to the setup function and add the teardown function. And this is going to be able to create and delete our ephemeral environment. Next, I'm going to update our CI automation configuration so that it is using these new ephemeral stacks. And finally, I'm going to allow the option of running tests against an existing stack that we won't tear down afterwards. And so let's get started. So the first step is to get the ephemeral stack management working. And there are a few ways to go about this. Uh, as I've mentioned before, John and I have written a book about Lambda and Java, and we have these ephemeral test environments in that book. And in there, we put the environment automation into the build scripting, since the, the tool that we use in that world, Maven, has really good support for having these hooks. For this coffee store app, though, for now at least, I'm going to put the automation into the test itself. And so most of our work is in the integration test file that we started back in episode four. Now we need to make some changes to the setup function, which in Jest is named before all. Now, first of all, up until now, the name of our deployment environment or stack has been provided externally. But now we need to come up with a new name for ourselves in the test. It needs to have some amount of uniqueness so that multiple instances of the test can be running at the same time. Now, I have a separate function here to generate that stack name, and I'm going to show you that in detail in a later slide. But all you need to know now is it generates this stack name and we assign it to a variable so that that stack name can also be used later during teardown. Once we have a stack name, we can deploy the stack. And what we really want to happen here is exactly what happens when we run the deploy.sh script that we've created before. And the best way to make sure that the result is the same as running the deploy.sh script is actually to run the deploy.sh script from our tests. And so that's what we do. There's a little bit of JavaScript and Node magic here to run an external process. But the summary is that we call the deploy script and wait for it to finish. And finally, we need to query the deployment environment's metadata. Now, this is exactly the same process that we had last time, but this time we're using the generated stack name. And this is all the changes that we need for our setup function. Now we need to add a teardown function, which in Jest is named after all. Our task here is fairly simple. Just delete the test environment. So since our project scripting doesn't yet have a feature to delete a stack, we just call CloudFormation directly, asking it to delete the stack that we created in the setup function. This call actually returns immediately rather than waiting for the stack to be deleted. And so you may want to check that your stacks, your stacks are actually getting cleaned up. Now, one quick note. I've chosen to implement this in a way that's easiest to explain. But for larger projects, this specific design I have here might need to be adapted. For instance, with Jest, the before all and after all functions run once per test file. We probably only want to create one ephemeral stack for all of our tests. And so you may want to do something differently once you have multiple integration test files. Alternatively, you can just stick with having one root integration test file 
with all the tests in that file, but calling out to code in other files. Now in Python and PyTest, we can have a folder level set up and tear down. And as I said before in Java, we typically put the environment automation into the Maven scripting. But whatever you do with whatever language that you're using, the principle is the same. We create an environment before the tests run. We use that environment with the tests and then we tear it down once the tests are complete. Now, one more small thing and we'll be done with this first step. By default, Jest expects to run in a few seconds. And so we need to configure it not to fail with the timescales that are now involved in deploying stacks to the cloud. By updating the integration test config file like I've done here, and by adding the corresponding test setup file, we now have a five minute timeout, which obviously we can change, but five minutes is plenty for now. I'm not ready to push these changes to GitHub yet, but I can now run them locally. If I just run npm test, you'll see that when the integration tests start, they first deploy a stack with a name based upon the current date and time. Once the stack has been successfully deployed, then the tests can run and they run using this newly created environment. Finally, once all of the tests are complete, the stack is deleted. So there we have it, ephemeral test environments. And that's actually the bulk of the work for this week, but let's do a couple more things just to tie a bow on this. First of all, I want to use these new ephemeral environments in my CI automation. Because this is a CI update, we need to change the build spec file. Before, the build spec needed to deploy the changes to the CI test environment. Now, the tests themselves handle that, and so we can delete the deploy.sh line from our build spec. Now, one thing that would be nice, though, is to know which ephemeral environments relate to our CI tests. And so what we're going to do is have a CI specific part in our ephemeral stack name. And we declare this in a new stack name prefix environment variable. And now we need to update the integration test to use this prefix. Now, all of the changes here are in stack naming. And so it's time to dig into that function that generates the stack name. First of all, we need to see whether the prefix environment variable has been set. If it has, we use it. Otherwise, we use a general prefix. And then we generate a stack name based upon this prefix, and in our case, the current date time. Now, you can actually do whatever you want here. And in fact, for your own project, you might want to simplify this. Now, I'm using this prefix and this date time, and unfortunately, to make it even more complicated, JavaScript doesn't have good date time formatting in its standard library. And I didn't want to pull in a third party library just for something this small. And so our actual name generation code here is pretty verbose. But ignore all of this complication. All that really matters here is that we generate a name that is almost always going to be unique and ideally always unique. And that it's somewhat useful to use when we actually read that name. Now, with this change made to our stack name generation, we can push our updates up to GitHub and we can let code build run. And let's see what happens when, the, when we do that. So here is the first part of the log from code build after we've pushed all of these changes. So first of all, note that our build spec change has kicked in and that our command for running tests includes the stack name prefix. Next, we can see the same logs that uh, we saw locally when we ran Jest. Our brand new stack is being deployed triggered by the test running in code build. And the name of that stack has the prefix that identifies it as a CI test environment. Later on in the code build log, we see the following. The stack is successfully created. The test finds the API endpoint for the new stack. And once all the tests are complete, the tests tear down the ephemeral stack. And that's it. CI integration testing using ephemeral stacks. It's almost kind of anticlimactic, but this is a really, really super useful technique. To be able to know that your integration tests are running against an entirely clean environment every time uh, your CI tests run 
is really, really confidence inspiring. Before I finish up this week, I wanna do one more thing. When I'm running integration tests from my laptop and I'm iterating on something, oftentimes I don't wanna go through the full deploy and delete cycle. I just wanna run the tests against my own personal deployment environment that the tests then leave in place. And so I want to add a switch that I want to add a switch to the tests that allow me to do this. This is actually a fairly simple change to the integration test code, but let's step through it. So first of all, I, as the integration test, want to see if a stack name variable is in the environment. And if it is, I'm going to use that fact for two things. First of all, if that stack name variable is there, I'm going to assume that I should not be using an ephemeral stack. And secondly, if that stack name variable is there, I'm going to use that stack name as the name of the application to test. So next, if I'm not using an ephemeral stack, then I skip the deployment step entirely, assuming that whoever ran the test has already performed the deployment that they need. And finally, if I'm not using an ephemeral stack, I don't delete the application under test once all the tests are complete. And so now I can run the tests specifying that stack name environment variable. And you can see that since the stack name variable is set, then the test uses that stack as the application to test. And then finally, after all the tests are complete, the stack is left as is. And that's the end of our code updates. So to summarize, there are now three ways of running the tests. First of all, if you want to use an ephemeral stack with the default name, you just run npm run integration test or npm test. If you want to use an ephemeral stack, but you want to use some kind of custom name prefix, then you can set the stack name prefix environment variable before running the tests. And this is what I've set our CI automation to do. And finally, if you don't want to use an ephemeral stack, but you want to use an existing stack, and you don't want that stack to be torn down when the tests are complete, then you can set the stack name environment variable before running the tests. So that's it for this week. Uh, here's what I covered today. So first of all, I talked about how to use ephemeral environments with integration tests. I talked about how to use those ephemeral integration environments within our CI automation. And then finally, how to be able to use existing environments uh, rather than ephemeral environments for quicker development cycles. So as I said, that's it. Uh, we're, we're six episodes in. Uh, I'm really excited that I got to this point. We So John and I worked on these ephemeral environments as part of uh, when we wrote our book, which I always have next to me. This is our book. Um, and, and when we finished that section in the book, I was, I was really excited because I hadn't really seen many people doing that. And so I knew that when I started this series that I, I wanted to sort of show that to everyone as well. I needed to re-implement it because the book's in Java and this is all in JavaScript. Um, but I, I really think this is a, a super powerful technique, um, especially for folks that are not used to running their integration tests in the cloud. And so I'm, I'm super excited uh, that I've, I've been able to show you this over the last few episodes. Um, so that sort of brings these last three episodes around integration tests to a, a close. I, I think what I'm going to cover next week um, are a couple of little things with code build, uh, just little fun things, um, and then probably start talking a little bit more about production deployment after that. Uh, and of course, the best way to know uh, when I've got those episodes produced and, uh, and uploaded is to subscribe. And while you're subscribing, it'll be even more awesome if you hit that like button. Hit hit that like button. Like button, it's great. Um, so of course, uh, there is resources for this, which you can find at this link. Um, and go to the, the GitHub repo, take a look. One of the things I haven't really mentioned so far is that the changes that are in the GitHub repo, I've, I've made explicitly clean, far cleaner than I normally have my GitHub commits. The idea being that you can read these changes um, and see a story being told as, as you actually look through uh, the Git log. Um, if you have any questions uh, or have any requests for future episodes, then of course, drop me a line. Uh, and otherwise, I will see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>